All right, now the last chapter of the book of Nehemiah we see here, Nehemiah is kind of, kind of recapping a lot of the things that he had done. And this is a period of time in the, in the, in the Bible when the children of Israel had, you know, this is after, you know, first you have Moses bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt and into the promised land. And then they had the period of the judges and then the kings were ruling and reigning over them. And you have these various kings would come and go where some were real righteous and some were evil. And um, all the way up through the point where they're carried away captive into Babylon. They get carried away captive because of their wicked sins that they had done. God was bringing judgment upon them. They had strayed away from serving the Lord. They were serving false gods. They were serving idols. God judged them and took them out of the land. But after 70 years, God decided to bring them back into the land again. He, you know, they, they were getting right. You have, you have great men of God here. We're preaching. You have Ezra and Nehemiah and these great guys that were, that were seeking the Lord. And were confessing their faults and their sins and God was listening to them. And after 70 years, he was bringing them back into the land. And Nehemiah, what I'm preaching about this morning is Nehemiah's house cleaning. Because basically what he was doing, he was trying to set a lot of things right that had gone by the wayside. Things that had been forgotten. Things they weren't doing right. Because they had just been living in this heathen land in Babylon for 70 years. And... Obviously, when you're, when you're put away in a place like that, they're going to be picking up a lot of the habits and a lot of things and losing a lot of the, the um, scriptural teaching and just not following them. Um, we see right off the bat in verse number one, it says, On that day they read in the book of Moses in the audience of the people. And one thing I want to point out too, if you read the rest of the book of Nehemiah earlier, a lot of people were real ignorant of God's word also. They simply didn't know. They, they would get like upset when they would hear God's word read because they would realize what bad sins they were in and all the things that they had done and it really bothered them. But, and that's a, that's a major problem as well. That's not what I'm, what I'm preaching on this morning. But you know, we all need to make sure that we're reading our Bibles and make sure that we know God's law and that we're not ignorant of it so we get involved in all kinds of wickedness that the Bible tells us not to get involved with. But it says here, he read on that day in the book of Moses in the audience of the people, and therein was found written that the Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever. This was a judgment of God against the Moabites and the Ammonites that they weren't allowed in because of the way that they dealt with the children of Israel. It says in verse 2, because they met not the children of Israel with bread and with water, but hired Balaam against them, that he should curse them. Howbeit our God turned the curse into a blessing. Verse 3, now it came to pass when they had heard the law that they separated from Israel all the mixed multitude. Now, they're getting right. See, one of the reasons why we need hard preaching, why we need to hear God's Word preach and it needs to be unadulterated, is because we need to get right with God. Every single person that's sitting here today has sin in their life. Nobody here is perfect. I don't know one perfect person. The only perfect man to ever walk this earth was Jesus Christ. We all need to get things right in our life. And we're going to see here in the rest of this chapter, Nehemiah was doing this on a broad scale. See, there's problems within the church, and there's problems within churches these days as well. I think there's been a lot of churches, independent fundamental Baptist churches, that have kind of been going by the wayside and getting watered down and getting more like this world, getting more like Babylon. We've got a movement growing now, and it needs to continue to grow, where people are, we're going to have leaders being taught and trained and standing up and trying to get us back to the old paths where we need to be teaching God's Word, the, the whole Word of God, all of it. And this isn't, you know, this isn't the most pleasant thing when you are mixed and mingled in with Ammonites and Moabites to say, hey, look, this is what the law says. They need to be separated. They're not allowed into the congregation of the Lord. And they need to be separated. So we need to have the hearts, first of all, as a congregation, to hear God's Word and to be able to listen to it, obey it, and say, okay, well, we're going to have to separate then. It may not be the most pleasant thing to do. It may not always give you that, that warm, cushy, fuzzy feeling inside to be obeying God's word to a T, but it's got to be done. If it's written in the law, if it's written in God's word, then we need to be, you know, adhering to it. Amen. Now look at what it says here um, in verse 4. We see another problem. There's a lot of problems that come up that, that Nehemiah is dealing with. He says, And before this, Eliashib the priest 
having the oversight of the chamber of the house of our God, was allied unto Tobiah. Tobiah was a wicked man. He was, you know, he was one of the ones that was that was trying to stop the the, the building of the wall of the of the Jew, of Jerusalem, of the temple and was was causing him a lot of problems and Eliashib the priest this is a problem with a man that was high up in the you know in the church leadership this is someone that you know he was he was a priest he had the oversight of the chamber of the house of God and he was allied unto Tobiah and it says here when he had prepared and he had prepared for him a great chamber so he made him this nice place to live where before it says a fourth time they laid the meat offerings the frankincense and the vessels so this guy is just just basically getting all this benefit that the that the priests were supposed to be getting. He was getting all this, um, you know, the tithes of the corn, the new wine, the oil, which was commanded to be given to the Levites and the singers and the porters and the offerings of the priests. Verse six. But in all this time was not I at Jerusalem. Was Nehemiah saying, "Look, I wasn't here for all of this. This was going on without me being aware of it because I wasn't even there." But when he comes back, when he comes back into town, he sets everything straight. Look at what he does. In, um, in verse number 8, I love this part of the story because it says here, And it grieved me sore. Therefore I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I commanded and they cleansed the chambers. And thither brought I again the vessels of the house of God with the meat offering and the frankincense. So he comes in and he says, you know what? Here's a problem. This, is wicked. this guy shouldn't be getting all the tithes in the corner. He shouldn't be living here. You know, um, Elijah the priest he shouldn't have been allowing this to happen but I'm gonna set it right and he, he goes in he takes all of his stuff he says well it's moving day and he just casts it all out of the of that room in that chamber that he had prepared for him and he is literally throwing out the stuff when he sees something that that's not supposed to be happening it's, it reminds me of Jesus Christ going into the temple and making that whip when people were buying and selling in the temple. Look, that shouldn't have been done. And, it, and Jesus had great zeal and he was angry. He said, this, is, this doesn't belong here at all. Just like Tobiah didn't, didn't belong in, in, the, you know, in that chamber. He goes in and he casts it out. And in a way, we need to be doing the same thing in churches these days of getting rid of the garbage and the trash that's made its way in, where you have maybe people in, in, uh, in higher positions with positions of great influence have allowed for the Tobias to come in and, and, get, and get rooted and, and embedded into the church. I'm talking about things like the, you know, buying and selling stuff within the church, whether it be coffees and books and all this other stuff that's made its way and has become acceptable in the church today. Would to God there'd be more, you know, men of God coming up and, and at least trying to be pastors and, and getting into leadership roles and saying, you know what, this stuff needs to get out of here and just, and just kicking this stuff out. I saw a video that um, Pastor Philenius had done. It's the same exact thing where he was taking the stuff, he had, he had kind of filled the position of a pastor in a new church or in another church, and he was getting rid of, of, all, of the, all the stuff that had crept its way in, all the paintings and all the, you know, the false Bibles and everything else that had been in there. He's cleaning house. And there needs to be a lot more cleaning house going on in the, in the churches across America today and across the world of Bible-believing Christians. We need to get back to adhering to God's Word. And, and reading it and saying, look, it may offend some people. Some people are going to be upset about that. Some people like buying their Starbucks in the morning right before church in the lobby of church. But it needs to go. That's not the place for that. If you want Starbucks, go to Starbucks before church. Don't go to the house of God to buy that stuff and to buy and sell in God's house because it's a house of prayer, not a house of merchandise. Right. There were other problems going on. The, the Levites who were supposed to be, you know, taken care of and paid for their service to God. Their job was to be daily ministering and doing the, the sacrifices and, and, and doing all the, all the work for God. They stopped giving them the tithes and the, of the corn and everything else to, to take care of them. So they had to go back and, and earn a living and go back to their field so that they could, they could live and try to do the work and he's saying that's wicked too, and he changed that. Excuse me. So that it was set the way that God had designed it to be. And I'll tell you what, there's a movement growing of people who think that pastors shouldn't be paid, and it's a bunch of nonsense. Right. 
It's, a, it, it's, it's the same exact reason why God had ordained for the Levites to be paid and, and supplied for and their, their needs met by the whole congregation, by the people that were gathering together, is so that they could do the full service of the, of the house of the Lord. And it's the same thing for the pastors. Why would you want your pastor going and having to work and going to his own field as well as doing all of the business that he has to do for God? All of the work. But um, I don't want to get too far off on that rabbit trail. Turn, if you would, on to verse 15 of Nehemiah. We're, we're staying within Nehemiah. Just jump down to verse 15. The Bible says, And in those days I saw Judah, some treading wine presses on the Sabbath. So here, and bringing in sheaves and lading asses as also wine, grapes, and figs, and all manner of burdens, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold victuals. So we see Nehemiah is a great man here. He's, He's standing up to a lot of things that had gotten, gotten bad and has gone, had gotten wicked and had gone the wrong direction. I mean, they were doing work on the Sabbath. They were buying and selling. And he's standing up and saying, no. And he gets to the point where he's like, he's locking the gates of the city. Now, Nehemiah was the governor. So he, you know, he had a little bit, he, had, he was in a good position of authority to do some of the things that he was capable of doing today. But when you apply this for yourself, you know, you may not have the authority to go and like, you know, we're not, we don't have to observe the, the Sabbath in the New Testament, but some of the things that he did, you know, was, was a little bit unique for his position. But you can still apply these same principles to your life and daily. And when you see the wickedness, especially in your own life, especially in your own life, when you see things that have crept in that you're allowing, you need to clean house. You need to get rid of it. Clean house physically. Get rid of the idols. Get rid of the, the garbage, the, the movies and DVDs and the music and the stuff that doesn't belong there that has crept its way in. Get rid of that stuff. And uh, <clears throat> even within the churches, you know, we should be, we should, we should be standing up against the, the wickedness that's going on. Let's, um, we're still staying in Nehemiah 13. We're not turning anywhere else today. But it got to the point in verse 21 where he says, Then I testified against them and said unto them, Why lodge ye about the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. From that time forth they came, came they no more on the Sabbath. It got to the point where he's like, Look, do I need to get physical with you? He's like, We are going to obey the Sabbath at all costs. He's saying, This is not a suggestion. This is a commandment, and we here in this house, in this city, we are not going to allow for the buying and selling. And if it means me putting hands on you, then that's what I'm going to do. And again, he was in a slightly, you know, he was in a unique situation being the governor and definitely having the authority to do such things. But still, it's the attitude that he had that we need to look up to of not being afraid, for one, of confrontation. We live in a society today where people are very afraid of confrontation yep. and I don't think it's always been that way and what's sad is especially when it's the men who are afraid of confrontation what's it's getting kind of backwards where it's more likely that you'll find a woman that's that's willing to have a confrontation with someone than a man yep. I'll give you a test here's an example when you next time you go out to the store when you just walk through just start looking people in the eyes and look how many people just look away you know, you don't have to say anything to them. Just, just, and you, I mean, you don't have to give them a weird, a weird <laughs> stare, but just, just make eye contact and, and, you know, and look at them. And so many people are afraid to even, they, they don't even want you looking at them. And, and we've, I think there's a lot of things involved with that in our society. With the, the men just kind of becoming more effeminate in general and being pushed through the through the media through the music of, of just this kind of sissification of men and and it's true i mean the, the movies are doing it they're trying to make you think that like oh you know the the soft-hearted guy the, the you know the the guy that's that's willing to open up his heart and cry and all this other stuff you know like that somehow girl you know that's what the girl wants and they like this stuff it's like no if you be a man all right. And men, now look, I'm kind of digressing, but, but the point is men shouldn't be afraid of confrontation. And in the Christian life, you're going to have a lot of it. And you can't back down from it. 
We need to get over this. We need to get more Nehemiahs to lead this way and to set things right. And even just individually with your own personal sins, with your own personal house cleaning. If you're a man, if you're a husband, and you, have, and you find that there's some wickedness in your house, maybe some Hollywood movies or something, but you're afraid of what your wife might think if you were to get rid of that, that is wickedness. You need to be able to overcome that. And as the, the, the head of the household, be able to say, you know what? In this household, we're going to serve the Lord and there's not going to be any wickedness here. We're going to take this trash and burn it. We're going to get rid of it. It's going to be gone. This is the way things will be done in this household. This is the way things are done in our churches. Or they ought to be. This ought to be the way, way you treat sin in your own household is that you're just going to get rid of it, not worry about and be afraid of the confrontation. Say, oh, well, I don't know what, what they might, they might get angry. We might have a fight. Look, you might have to have a fight about it. There might have to be an argument about it, but as, especially as the man, you need to say, this is the way things are going to be. This is the way it is because we will not allow wickedness in this household. Jump down, if you would, to verse 23. Actually, no, jump down to, jump down to verse 30. I'm going to wrap it up with this. He says, Thus cleansed I them from all strangers, and appointed the wards of the priests and the Levites, everyone in his business. And for the wood offering at times appointed and for the first fruits, remember me, O oh my God, for good. Now, if you notice, we read the entire chapter before we started uh, the preaching. There was at least three verses where Nehemiah said, remember me, O oh God, remember this stuff that I did. Remember these things. And he brings up all these different examples of, of the, you know, the outlandish women causing people to sin, the Moabites and the Ammonites coming into the congregation of the Lord, you know, Tobiah being in the chamber of the house of God, and in all of these various areas, people working on the Sabbath, and all of the work that he did in cleaning that up. And he keeps saying, remember me, O oh my God, remember me, O oh my God. Remember me for this good. Now think about yourself. If you were to say to God today, remember me, oh my God, what would you say that for? What's the good that you've done in your life where you've done some house cleaning like ne Nehemiah's done? Where you can say, remember me, oh God, for X, Y, or Z, this is what I've done. And if you don't have anything to say for it, you ought to do something about that. There's a lot of things you could do. One is just going to be just look internally into your own household, into your own life, and get the wickedness out. But number two, why don't you, we need more leaders. We need more people that are willing to sacrifice a lot of their own personal desires in this world. A lot of their own things that they had decided, well, you know, I kind of wanted to have this career and I want to have this house and I want to have this and I want to have that for myself. And are we willing to sacrifice that and say, you know what? No, I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to stand up and I'm going to serve God because no one else is doing it. And we need way more people cleaning things up and getting us back into, into the good graces of our Lord and get us back into the ways that the Bible has prescribed that we need to be following. Back in a way where we could read the Bible and read it literally and not try to explain away all of the things that you don't like about it. Because that's what most of the majority of what so-called Christianity does today. They either don't read it at all, or they'll make up excuses or make up new Bible versions or whatever they want to do to try to change it. And it has plagued and infected the American culture as a whole. Because there's not enough people doing the house cleaning like Nehemiah did and saying, you know what, we're not going to stand for this. We are going to be a people separated unto God. We are not going to allow for this stuff to creep into our lives as it may have been for decades or hundreds of years or however long things have been going on. We need to be able to look at the page of this book and say, I don't care how long it's been going on for. I don't care if the world accepts it. I don't care if Christianity accepts it. If it's contrary to what the Bible says, we're going to do things God's way. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I pray that you would please just 
embolden us. Help us to stand firm on your word. God, it, it, obeying your commands will come with persecutions. It will come with confrontations, dear Lord. Strengthen our spirit. Edify us. Build us up in these churches, dear Lord, where we have a lot of people of like-minded believers coming together. Help us to be able to be comforted through the, the trials and tribulations that other people are going through and be strengthened to do more exploits. God, I believe that we are truly in the very last days. And I know that it's written in your word that there shall be many great exploits done by Christians. And, and I pray that, that if we truly are in those very last days, that you would use us and help us to raise up and to train up more people to do as many of these exploits as possible. It's an exciting time to be in, dear Lord. I pray that you please strengthen us, help us to get back as close as possible. Give us the wisdom, give us the knowledge, dear Lord, of your word. We have a heart that's desirous to serve you. Help us to, to have a zeal that's, that is according to knowledge, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.